John chapter 15, beginning in verse 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. These things I command you that you love one another. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of this world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had come and spoken to them, they would have no sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would, not, they would have no sin. But now they have seen and also hated both me and my father. But this happened that the word might be fulfilled, which is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for just your ability by your Holy Spirit to speak to us uniquely, individually, as we have need, Lord, by your, by your Spirit. And we're so grateful for him. We pray that he would be our teacher this morning. And we ask, Lord, for a supernatural work. Lord, help us to be focused on not just what we agree with, but where we're being disobedient, where we're not obeying you. We know that, that you love, that for us to show our love for you, you require us to be obedient to you. So that's what we want to do. We want to have your word change us, make us more like you, and to further conform us into the image of Christ, and to do your perfect work in us and through us. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Well, we are walking uh, step by step uh, th- through this this last time period where Jesus' last teachings that he that he's revealing to the disciples in the in the upper room or by the upper room, um, and this is the night in which he is going to be betrayed. In a few hours, he's going to be betrayed, and the sheep are going to scatter. These disciples are going to scatter. And he's going to continue, as we'll see, to give them all this, these amazing truths, all this revelation that they're going to need. Not one syllable is going to be wasted in their lives. They're going to fall back on these things. He's already promised that he would send the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit would bring back to the remembrance, their remembrance all these things that he has said. They didn't have time to write notes. They didn't have time to jot things down. They definitely didn't have any technology that would record uh, what he said. But but something much greater than that, the Holy Spirit would be able to help them and bring these things back to them. So he's going to talk to them about some hard truths today. And he's been recently speaking about bearing fruit and the importance of it. And that that, um, we are his branches. Jesus is the true vine, not Israel. And uh, he was going to bear fruit be- through us. And the Father is the vine dresser. And he uniquely lifts us and washes and cleanses us by his word so that we'll bear even much fruit. But um, all those things were just um, for them to, to be able to trust him to, to live his life through their lives. We're going to see soon in the verses that he's going to say, it's to your advantage that I go away. They would have been totally happy and content with just, it's going to be just as good as when I was with you, but he ups that one more above that and says, to to your advantage, it's even better than what you have now. But now he's not not just telling them what they are delighted to hear. He's going to tell them some hard truths. Things don't always go the way that we expect. And they, they weren't just going to go from mountaintop experience to mountaintop experience. That's what we want, uh, right? But uh, that's not always the case. For sure, in this life, we will face tribulation. It's already said that. So they would actually uh, be hated. And eventually, the, each one of them would uh, be either martyred, or in the case of the Apostle John, they would try to martyr him, try to burn him with oil, but he survived. That's discouraging when you trying to, you know, martyr somebody and it doesn't work and, and you, have every, you have every possible 
advantage to, to make sure that it works. And it, you know, it always, and I'm sorry to bring back something that is not in my notes because you always suffer for it. Um, but I remember watching Batman growing up and it just used to tear me up. There's two episodes. You know, the first one at the end, they, there was the cliffhanger, you know, and they, and they were like put this elaborate contraption that they're trapped in, Batman and Robin were. And then, of course, the, the villain would always just take off and leave. Nothing better to do than to follow through and make sure they died. They had something better to do, so they would leave, and that would give them the opportunity to, to, to get free, to somehow, you know, Batman would say, if I could only reach whatever, whatever in my utility belt, Robin, old chum, and, and uh, you know, and, and then he would finally be able to do something to get out of it. But as a four- and five-year-old, I didn't know that. And I was just going crazy, just like, what's going to happen? Are they going to die every week? Because I wasn't old enough to realize that this is a pattern. Um, so they didn't know this, that, that, that all this, th- all this would, would happen, and they, and they wouldn't be able to you know, get out of being persecuted for, for these things to happen. So, so he's going to warn them that they would be hated, you know, He's, he's going to help them and understand that hard times are coming, persecution is coming. Um, you know, we we really like to be liked, don't we? Yeah, I hear that. Yeah, uh, I have found that I'm naturally very good at being liked. I excel at being liked. I'm not very good at being hated, and 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 not. And it really doesn't. What no, most of us perf- experience is not even being hated, at least in this country. Most of us experience just not being preferred. You know, that's hard enough for me to take. We're not someone's cup of tea. So it's not even slightly about, I, I don't even slightly handle that well in terms of just not being preferred because we love to be liked. We, we, and, and, and we would be happy if people just, every, if everyone just liked us. We don't even have to have the, people love us. That's like going over the top. Just to have everybody like us, that's what we really want. But the problem is, Jesus said the world is something that needs to be overcome. He said, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So the, the, the world is positioned to be an adversary and have an adversarial relationship with us. And, and the reason why is because the world just happens to be full of humans who are fallen. And it turns out, apparently, hum, fallen human beings don't like being told they're fallen. Imagine that. Go figure. You know, we don't like to be told that we're disconnected from God, that we're sinners, that we can't save ourselves, and that our only possibility of salvation is to humble ourselves like a child, as Jesus said, and to trust in what Jesus did for us uh, to go to heaven. So Jesus comes in and tells them persecution is coming, and he says, I'm not escaping that persecution, and you won't either. And he's trying to give them extreme clarity. He doesn't beat around the bush. I love that about the Lord. He just plainly tells them the truth. Remember the time when he finally said about Lazarus, Lazarus is dead. You know, I would have phrased that totally different. You know, he, Lazarus is taking a nap forever, <laughs> you know, or he's, he's, he's moved on, you know, but he says, Lazarus is dead. He's so blunt and direct. So today Jesus is going to level with them and tell them that they will suffer as he is about to. So I've entitled this message this morning, hatred from the world is certain. And he's, and he's going to talk about how the, how the, um, every servant, no matter who he is, cannot rise above his master. So everything that they experience there, you know, as, as the master, why would a servant or a slave ever think that they're going to have a different experience than their master in terms of how things are set up, how uh, circumstances happen? And he says, it's not going, you're not going to experience a better outcome than me. And you're going to walk in my footsteps. So let's begin in verse 16. Notice that Jesus begins with uh, who chose whom? And look with me at verse 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. So it's about to get 
um, he's about to get to, 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 to how bad things are going to get with them. And, and he starts with the fact that, and this is not by accident, that, that they didn't choose him. And he, uh, you know, he's the one that chose them. And that, and, that, and that the whole issue of persecution shouldn't shock you. You know, Peter later would write this persecution. Don't think that, you know, this something strange has happened to you. He's saying it's normal. It's normal for a disciple to have people persecute. It's not fun. It's, it's hor- horrific. Most of us haven't experienced significant persecution. We can get a dirty look from somebody and think I'm being persecuted for my faith somehow. Uh, but that's usually not the case. Um, so each of them remembers, and he's talking about recent history with them and how he chose them. Each of them remembers the circumstances around which they came to be his disciples. Because all of them were personally called by Jesus. He doesn't record every single one of them, but, but they were all specifically called by Jesus. Every, every one of them remembers that experience, where they were. You know, when big events happen, you wonder, you think about, where was I? Everyone knows where we were when we heard about 9-11. You know, and, and we, these, these big significant things. Some of you remember when Kennedy was assassinated, what you were doing when you heard that. Um, you know, we, 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 these monumental things. So everyone remembers what, what they were doing, what they were in the middle of, what their plans were. Then all of a sudden they met Jesus and Jesus called them. John remembers it. He, we've seen it in the beginning of, of the, this gospel that we're studying. He remembers that time when he got called. And then later on, we see in the other gospels, it's probably a year later where he called the other disciples and formally called James and John and, and made them the, his apostles. So I love the fact that he, he gives them this truth and, and um, he, he, he's reminding them, I chose you, you didn't cho- choose me. And this is not something that was, um, was normal. First, to, you know, normally a person, a man or a boy rather, would go through a special school and, and the special school was for top achievers. It was already decided way back in, in before he was, you know, in, even in high school when he was just beginning junior high around that time, it, th- this whole uh, trajectory was laid out for them because they've excelled, they would, they would recognize their gifts and their aptitude and all those things and they would go to a special school and, and there wasn't a lot of people that went to the school, but it was common for when you, when you were done with the school um, that you would um, then choose basically your rabbi that you were going to follow. Of course, the rabbi had to agree, and they usually did. These students were top-notch, but he still had the right, first right of refusal. But you normally chose your rabbis and not the other way around. And so... Um, what Jesus did by, by choosing them and calling them, verse 19, we're told that he had chosen them out of the world. We're also told in our verse, in, in verse 16, that he chose and appointed them and that they should go and bear fruit and that their fruit should remain, something that God's called each of us to engage in, to bear fruit, the kind of fruit that remains or self-sustaining or, or um, another way you could say it would be um, endures, you know, not, I mean, real fruit that he values is fruit that continues to bear fruit and, and, and multiplies itself. And the God's ultimate design for a disciple of, of his is that he'd be able to reproduce. He'd be, an, an, you know, knowledge enough, experienced enough, godly enough, other centered enough to actually preach the gospel to somebody and they would be able to, um, you know, receive Jesus as their Messiah and follow him. So he's called each of us out of the world. He wants to bear fruit through our lives, the kind that remains. And that's the main reason why I believe the world hates Jesus' disciples. It's because we're not influenced by them. That, that's the true disciples are not influenced by the ways of this world. We're not affected by the spirit of the world. John's going to talk about that in his first epistle. The spirit of the world and, and all the things that it promises and all the things that you know, it, it, it basically communicates is worth our time, which is not, which is not worth our time. And it's, and everything is completely, um, you know, uh, you know, not, not how God wants it in terms of how he is working in our lives. So, so people hate it when, when people that we know receive Christ, they hate it. They hate the message. And they also hate the fact that somebody that they know 
is, is now following Jesus, and it's convicting for them. They despise it. And I don't know if it's just because they're going to hear the gospel and they don't want to hear the gospel. I also think it's, it's connected to them being reminded that they're not right with God. And I remember sitting in front of the TV as a kid, and I would flip that. Now, this is how old I am. I you know, flipped the channel. You know, I didn't have a clicker. We used to call it a clicker. Um, but, you know, you just, you just go up to actually go up to the TV and turn the knob and change the channel. And I would tur- turn it to Christian television and get so mad. And I remember just thinking to myself, why am I getting so mad about Christian television? I, I, there, and and you know, it wasn't some deep insight that I had about myself or whatever. I just like, this is, my reaction is not in line with what it should be based on all this is. It's just, in my mind, it was all phony and you know, that, that was irritating, but just, it, it just had this, I just had this, this reaction that I believed wasn't normal. So um, I don't know what they're all the reasons why, but then Jesus adds that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. So why is this included in here? He's saying that part of being somebody that bears fruit and that is hated by the world is somebody that has their prayers answered. And, and notice he says, whatever you ask the Father in my name. What is that in my name? Just saying in Jesus' name at the end of the prayer? No. It's a name was your character. It was who you were. It was, it was your reputation and, and in line with who you, who you are. It's, you say to somebody, that man has a good name. That's what, that, that's what you're saying. And he's saying, if you ask, ask the Father in my name, in, li- in alignment with my character, my word, all those things, it will be given you. And they needed the confidence that in the context of being in God's will, that they could ask things that w- were God's will, and God would be faithful to answer those things. So he adds that on. It's not insignificant. It's not a parenthetical statement. It's a critically a part of what he's trying to get across to them. And he says in verse 17, these things I command you, that you love one another. And as you look at these verses, it's easy for us to have the reaction like, why does he put this in here in the midst of talking about how the world's going to persecute them and hate them and all these things? Well, thinking about what he's about to tell them, how the world hates them and will continue to hate them and everything, he knows that we need to have love. It's a great, it's a great need in our lives. And so if the, if the whole world is against us and hates us, that doesn't follow Christ, then we have, we need, he knows we need to get love somewhere, and he's intended for us to get that love through the body of Christ. And, and we, that's why I always refer to us as a family, because we are a family, and we need all the things that family, that healthy, functional families, not dysfunctional families, offer, and that is unconditional love and patience and being there for one another and, and all the things that a regular family automatically has that is a healthy family. So he says, remember, these things I command you, that you love one another. Why does he have to command us? Because we're definitely unlovable sometimes. I don't know if you notice that, that you're unlovable sometimes. You know, do you know that? Do you have a sh- bumper sticker that says, for sure I'm unlovable sometimes? You know, probably not. But we are unlovable. But the cool thing is he's called us, he doesn't say when someone's lovable, I command you to love them. Think about that. There's no circumstances people have to, to meet or to walk in for us to, for them to be worthy for us to be able to love them. He just says, love them. I'm giving you this command. You know, he loves us, and we're definitely not worthy, you know, and you might say, well, he's God. Well, that's true, but, but he modeled what we are called to do. So love, and I want to remind us that love is not affection. It's not merely affection. You know, the, the world thinks that love is an emotion, you know, but really it's, it, you know, it's, it's an action. It's a decision, a willful, volitional decision to do its best for the other person. It's an action word. It's like he's saying, I, this, uh, uh, these things I command you, that you actively, proactively demonstrate what's best for the other person. Maybe that helps us with understanding this whole term of love because the world defines love as something that is something that, that's elusive, that one day I have it, other day it's gone. Where'd it go? I had love for you. I've lost that loving feeling. Now I got to get that back. I got to conjure it up. I got to have, no, that's affection. He doesn't call us to merely have affection. He's called us to have love. Love is actively doing what's best. Then he, then he gets into the real, you know, bad news in verse 18. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated 
you. And I want you to know the word if there at the beginning of verse 18, it's properly understood as since. There is, there's a construction in the original language that makes it be that. So really he's saying, if the world hates you, and it does, you know that it hated me first before it hated you. Now he's, he, he's going to use it in, the, in, a different ver, in a different verse coming up that's going to mean something different. But for this verse, though, we need to know he's, it's basically since the world hates you. So that's, calm, that's, that's present tense there. Right now it hated them. They've already experienced that to an extent, but not nearly what he's experienced. But they, already, they know this, and the word know there is our, our famous familiar word, gnosko, which means knowledge by experience. So he's literally saying, you already know by experience that it hated me before it hated you. They'd already seen it. They'd already experienced it. And, and that isn't even close to the hatred that they're going to see. These very disciples are going to abandon him. These very disciples are going to be scattered. Jesus already told them that. It will fulfill prophecy that they're going to be scattered. So they're not going to be faithful all the way to the end with them. They're going to be, be engaged in extreme self-preservation and just bolting when he gets arrested. And, and so um, they're running from their lives. And, you know, uh, you know, Peter tries to fight back, you know, and chops the ear off. I'm sure he was aiming for his whole head. So it's like lesson number one, fishermen, don't try to be swordsmen, you know, and, and think that you're going to be any good because he definitely wasn't. And, and Jesus had to, now he had to do surgery, supernatural surgery, and put Malchus's ear back on. Uh, and, and so G Peter's going to also deny him three times, and the, even to the point where he's going to de deny him and say, I don't even know him. He's going to use profanity to try to convince them that he's not one of the disciples. So huge, huge, huge um, things he's laying out, huge implications for what he's saying to them. And, and he knows that they're going to tuck away these things in their hearts. And later the Holy Spirit's going to bring it back. And it's going to be greatly used by the Lord. Now notice in verse 19, Jesus explains why the world hates us. Look with me at verse 19. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Now look at the word if at the beginning of verse 19. That's that construction really means if. So he's saying, if you, were of the, if you were of the world, but you're not, the world would love its own here. So, but they weren't of this world. We are not of this world. Another, word, another way of saying it is saying we don't belong to the world. And, and we are not of this world. We are not the world's own. Jesus chose us out of this world, so the world hates us. We don't, we don't march to their beat. You know, we don't do the things that they uh, want us to do because they want us to do whatever they're doing that makes them feel better about them doing what's against what God would want them to do. It feels better when you have a group of people. When you're doing the wrong thing, it's easier to do the wrong thing and it's more pleasurable to the flesh when you're doing it with other people. I think we could all agree with that. But the reality is what God says is that we don't belong to this world at all. And, our, and Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, that our citizenship is in heaven. That's our true identity. And it doesn't matter what we think about it. It doesn't matter what we feel about it. It doesn't matter what other people say about what our true identity is. God defines what our true identity is. And our true identity is that we are citizens of heaven. We all already, already right now, currently, present tense, are citizens of heaven. So related to us and God, you know, and, and the world and all of that, uh, how they treat us, they, all they know is how to experience hatred. It makes no sense if you think about it. Our, our, relig our religion, if you want to use that word, its founder was all about love, was all about teaching. He was, he was sinless. All, he said to do good, to pray, to be, you know, submitted to authority, to do good, to, to, to love our enemies, so for, for people to hate Jesus and to hate us who connected with him, it's completely irrational. There's no logic behind it. They should love us. If you think about, well, these people actually sacrificially love other people. These people care for the needy. I mean, all the orphanages, all the nonprofits, all of those things historically have all been done by Christians. 
No atheist ever started a, you know, a, 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 an orphanage. You know, they, they're, they're, their focus is on their self, not on others. So the world should, and logically, logically, the world should be celebrating Christians. The world should be wanting us to have as much influence as possible because that will help situations because we're loving people, we're serving people, we're supporting people, we're, we're loving unconditionally. That we should be the most popular thing going. But we're not. It's the opposite. And that just screams to man's condition apart from the Lord. It speaks that we're fallen. It speaks that we don't want to hear that message because the Holy Spirit's putting an exponent above that message, the gospel, and it's convicting. And people don't want to be convicted of their sin. They want to be the Lord of their own life and do what they want to do and not have anyone, including God, get in the way. Sometimes I ask unbeliever, does, unbelievers, does God have the right being your creator? Let's just say he was your creator. Does he have the right to tell you what to do being your creator? And it's hard for him to say yes, because logically, of course, it's rational for us to have God be able to tell us his creation what to do. But that just shows you the epitome of, or the actual root of our flesh is selfish. And our flesh wants to do what it, what it wants to do. Even God doesn't have the right in terms of how our flesh deals with things to tell us what, tell us what to do. And so this world is famous for hating Christians are known for hating Christians. You don't know that if you're not a Christian, but once you're a Christian, you know that. One writer has said, it is not without significance that the disciples are to be known by their love, the world by its hatred. So the, the world is known for its hatred for, for Christians. Another writer wrote, the hatred of the world, instead of being depressing, should be exhilarating as being an evidence and guarantee that they have been chosen by Christ. Jesus said, when all people persecute you, rejoice because the Holy Spirit rests upon you. It's actually an evidence that we're in the truth and that we truly have been born again, that we've crossed over from death to life, the fact that we get persecuted. Unbelievers don't get persecuted. When you were an unbeliever, did you get persecuted? No, you didn't for being a Christian because you weren't one yet. So that's, that's cr critical in understanding what, why. We have to, I mean, when we understand that it's irrational, it's, it's an expression of the sinful nature, and it makes no sense, and that it, the fact that they're guilty makes them want to reject God and us as his children gives us evidence that we're in the truth, and that, and that, again, God chose us out of the world. It's an evidence that he chose us out of the world to bear fruit and to be salt and light. One of the things that salt does is it stings when you get it into a wound. You know, and we're salt in the, in the sense of we're pres preserving the world, like salt was meant to preserve, but also it's we're kind of can be an, an you know an irritant, and and people all of a sudden have something else that they need to do when we come around. You know, you ever had that where you're you're at work or something and you go to the water cooler? I, is that still where people talk? I'm not, I don't know, but maybe, probably in some places they're still talking at water coolers. So you're at the water cooler and you just approach. And they're, they've been talking about something, enjoying talking to each other. You show up, the conversation ends, they get their water and they just, they take off. Or they get all weird and make you feel uncomfortable. And, you know, they don't want you to be a part of their lives because they're convicted by God in, inside of us. You know, people can be attracted to Jesus inside of us. And I love when I'm seeing the evidence of that. But they also can be convicted by Jesus inside of us too. Even when we're being completely loving and tactful and appropriate in how we're saying what we're saying that contradicts uh, their position re regarding God, knowing that they need to be told the truth. Now, he continues in verse 20, remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. If they kept my word, they will kept yours, or yours also. So we're not greater than our master, and we're going to get to the different results. He experienced persecution, but he also experienced people receiving and keeping his word. And if people kept his word, he said, they'll keep ours. So his, again, he's so loving, he doesn't ask us to do anything that he hasn't first already done and led by example. Verse 21, but all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not uh, know him who sent me. It's all because we're connected with 
him. The world loves guilty by association. They excel at it. The fact that we're connected to the Lord and we claim to be believers and they don't like Jesus, they hate Jesus, then they're going to hate us because we're connected to him. But it's more than that. It's about what it, it, what it says about them. Again, they don't want to deal with the fact that they're not right with God and they're doing things that they know in their heart of hearts that they shouldn't be doing. The Holy Spirit's faithful in his ministry to convict the world of sin. He hasn't called any Christian to convict the world of sin. Yes, we speak out. Yes, we're salt and light, all those things. But in terms of the actual conviction, the Holy Spirit's role is to convict the world of sin. We make a lousy Holy Spirit. God hasn't called us to you know, convict the world of sin. He's called us to um, love people and tell them the truth, no matter what the, that truth is. So he knows that and he reveals that. And then now he's going to connect in verse 22, the guilt. He's going to connect the world with the religious leaders. He's going to equate those two. Now, it goes beyond the religious leaders, but it also includes them, these people that the, the, the Jewish community is so well respected. Look with me at verse 22. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would have no sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. Just look at those first few words, if I had not come. I mean, you could just do a whole sermon. Whole sermons have done on that, have been done on that. What if he had not come? But he's saying, I, I've spoken to them and done the things, and he's going to say, done the things that, that only I could do. But he uses the word excuse there. Look at that word at the end of verse 22. But now they have no excuse. In the King James, that's actually the word cloak. And it's communicating that you're hiding something. You're hiding your true intentions. Um, Paul would later write that we didn't have a cloak of covetousness talking about his motivation for why he was ministering to the, to the church. So they, they, he's saying they have no excuse for their sin. They have no way that they can cover and hide the, the reality of their sin because of the things that I have said. And then he says in verse 23, he who hates me hates my father also. There's a lot of people that claim that they love God. A lot of people, and talk is cheap. But when they claim they love God but yet they hate Jesus, Jesus says we can know that they hate the Father as well, that they hate God, no matter what they say. So it's all a matter of what are you going to do with Jesus? The same thing that Pilate had to deal with. What am I going to do with this Jesus? If we choose to hate him, we're choosing to hate his Father because it's a package deal. They, they go together. Now, he, now he, he, does, he adds to not just words, but actions. Look at verse 24. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would have no sin. But now they have seen and also hated both me and my father. If I hadn't done, fulfilled all these prophecies and did, did the works that those prophecies talked about, that the Messiah would do miracles and, and everything, they wouldn't be guilty, but they are. And we have, in this book, we've seen a little bit a little hint that they knew that, they knew that he was from God. Nicodemus said this in John chapter 3, verse 2. We know that you are a teacher come from God. Notice he says, we, we know. He's part of the elite Sanhedrin. We know that you're a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with them. So they, they admitted that these signs are miracles, that God would have to be with the person in order for them to do it. He, you've come from God. You are of God. But, but they didn't like the conclusion because that necessarily meant they needed to trust in the Messiah and relinquish all spiritual authority over to him and let him lead the nation spiritually. They weren't willing to do that in part because man loved darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil and because they were getting rich off this whole sham of the offerings and, and, and ripping them off for these animals that people would need to buy coming from long distances to celebrate the feasts. So we're told that, that, um, that it's inexcusable that they would reject him. But now, look at verse 25, he deals with it's inevitable that they would reject. First, look at verse 25. But this happened that the word might be fulfilled, which is written in their law, they hated me without a cause. So they didn't have a legitimate cause for hating him. Because he says that they're going to hate you because they hated me first, but their hate for me first 
was actually a fulfillment of prophecy. This is not something careening out of control. This is something God's in control. He foresaw it, and he has a plan for it, and he's trying to help them see the big picture. And I want to read some of you to, to you some of these prophetic scriptures that he's um, talking about. Verse 1 is from Psalm 35, verse 19. Let them not rejoice over me who are wrongfully my enemies, nor let them wink with the eye who hate me without a cause. Also, Psalm 69, verse 4, we're told, those who hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of my head. They are mighty who would destroy me because my enemies wrongfully, or being my enemies wrongfully, though I have stolen nothing, I still must restore it. And then lastly, we're told in Psalm 109, verses 2 through 5, for the mouth of the wicked and the mouth of the deceitful have opened against me. They have spoken against me with a lying tongue. They have also surrounded me with words of hatred and fought against me without a cause. In return for my, lo- for my love, they are my accusers, but I give myself to prayer. Thus they have rewarded me evil for good and hatred for my love. So, so Jesus loved them. People wonder, did, they, did Jesus love the Pharisees and the religious leaders? Yes. Part of the parable that he talked about, about the, the, uh, the, the, the prodigal son, the older son in that parable was a picture of the religious leaders. And, and he was reach, doing that in part to reach out to them, to help them see that they need to rejoice just, just like the prodigal son. The, the father rejoices over them and, and wants him to enjoy everything like the, the younger son who came back did. And sad that they, that they didn't. So it shouldn't surprise us that um, he says the servant is not greater than his master and that we will be persecuted without a cause as well. Because he's saying if they hated me to that extent, they're going to hate you in the sense of they're going to, to not have a cause for your, their hatred. The stupid, um, yes, I said stupid. In Proverbs it says that those who can't take correction are stupid. So it's biblical, don't worry. But it's stupid that they come up with these uh, just extravagant theories to express their hatred. And, and it makes no sense whatsoever. And, and it's just completely irrational. And our response can, in the flesh can be to pounce back and make them feel stupid. But that's not how, what God's called us to. God's called us to love our enemies, to not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good, to turn the other cheek, to, to pray for those who despitefully use us, to yield our lives over to God in the middle of that that situation and see what God wants to do through it. Have you ever been attacked without a cause? It's very painful. But when we're attacked without a cause, again, we're sharing in the sufferings of Christ. We're identifying with Christ in a way we could never, ever identify with him in a way that that reveals that we are from God and we are of God and we are citizens of, of heaven. And, and so we, we need to know that God wants to encourage us. And also he's not gone before us and been that faithful high priest. He's going to pray in chapter 17, that famous high priestly prayer and, and talking about the, you know, all these things. And Hebrews talks about that, you know, he was tempted just like we are yet without sin. There's nothing that he can identify with us with in terms of what we go through. As I close... I want to talk about, um, I have a few more scriptures to read, but first I want to talk about kind of how we can look at David as a model of how to handle bad situations, how to handle being persecuted, how to handle being um, hated without a cause. David was hated by King Saul. King Saul was jealous of him. King Saul knew that God had appointed him and anointed him to be king. And David wasn't going to make that happen. He wasn't going to make him being king happen because if God can choose me among Jesse's seven sons out of the, out of the, you know, the the hills of Bethlehem when I was being faithful, doing what God had called me to do, if God can still anoint me as king, then he can put me in that position in his timing. And who am I to get in the way of that? But Saul was actively pursuing his life. And David was a warrior. He was known for being brave. He was known for being this brave warrior who slew Goliath when he was a teenager. But yet, because he wanted to honor God and trust God's timing, he never usurped that timing. He never tried to speed it up. And this is the key part. 
he allowed the whole nation to come to the wrong conclusion about him and his bravery. He was willing to let the whole nation come to the wrong conclusion to do what was right to maintain his character. And the old saying goes, it's not our responsibility to protect our reputation as believers. It's our responsibility to protect our character. God will take care of our reputation. The enemy knows if he can just start these fires in our life and we're going to spend all our time trying to put out these fires and protect our reputation, we're going to be sidetracked. We're going to be distracted and we're not going to be fruitful in what God's called us to do. So he calls us to entrust our lives to him and to trust God with our reputation. There's a few scriptures I want to read and then we'll close here. Jesus said in Luke chapter 6, verse 26, woe to you when all men speak well of you. Woe to you when all men speak well of you. Now, isn't that what we want? Don't we want all men to speak well of us? Why? Because we want their approval, number one. But why is that wrong? Why, why does Jesus say, woe, like beware? Because, when all, because all men are sinful. And, and if we have all men speaking well of us, then that's not a good thing not a good, if you have wrong friends, you know, we talk to our teenagers about choose your friends wisely. You know, if they choose the wrong friends, they can get approval from the wrong people. And it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't, there's no, there's nothing laudable or respectful about when wrong people are impressed with us. So Jesus warns believers, woe to you when all men speak well of you. If all men speak well of you, something's wrong. You're compromising somewhere. You're compromising somewhere. So he says, woe to you when all men speak well of you. Then in Proverbs 29, verse 25, we're told, the fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. The fear of man is a snare. And, and, and it's, it will cause us to not be fruitful. It will cause us to do things we never really, ordinarily would never do. You know? And so he, that's in the Old Testament. That's, that's written a thousand years before Jesus was born. It, it was long in their history. The fear of man brings a snare. Now, lastly, I want to read from Galatians chapter 1. The Apostle Paul speaking in verse 10, he says, For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I still pleased men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. Notice the word still there. Do you see that? For if I still pleased men. We, it's revealed by the Holy Spirit that Paul was a man pleaser. We don't see that anywhere else in Scripture that Paul was a man pleaser. He lays out all of his accomplishments and, and how he excelled beyond any of his peers, even to the persecution of the church, he said. He caused people to blaspheme and all these things that are, are horrible. But we know his motivation from this verse inspired by the Spirit. He was doing it to please men. And so he says, do I still seek to please men? And if, or if I please, still please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. Those two things are mutually exclusive. If we're trying to be a bondservant, which means a willing slave, and we're trying to please men, it's impossible. We have to choose. We, have to, we can't serve two masters. And so we need to, if we're going through a situation right now where we're being persecuted, people are hating us without a cause. Again, that's a sign that God's Holy Spirit rests upon us. It's a sign that we're on the right track because people that never get attacked are people that never do God's will and never bear fruit, you know? So we have to understand that. But he also, he said, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. We cannot be a bondservant of Christ and be man pleasers. We can't. We have to do what and, and please God. That's what he's called us to. So we can't think that there's something strange happening to us when we're persecuted. We can't think that. That would be, um, that would be unwise. And so either we're going through something now and that can greatly encourage us, or we can tuck this away in our hearts. And, and when the time's right, when we're being hated without a cause, when we're being persecuted, we can bring this back and think about it and have the Lord minister to us. But either way, he wants us to know this and understand it and know that, that not some strange thing hasn't happened to us. It's normal for the Christian. You know, we're told in Scripture, anyone who wants to live a righteous life will face persecution. We could say, well, I don't face persecution. Well, maybe we're not, we're not engaged in a righteous life because that includes preaching the gospel and being bold for him and saying things that people don't want to hear at times where the Holy Spirit prompts us to say it. In love, of course, but we're still opening up our 
mouth. You know, the intimidation factor of this world and being canceled and cancel culture and being kicked off social media and all these things is all meant to affect us boldly sharing the, our faith and our views. We can't allow people to intimidate us and, and shut us up because God's called us to be salt and light and called us to be bold for him. And he wants us to do that. So let's pray together. Lord, we, re- we actually really, really receive this, Lord. And I pray that you would encourage your people and lift our heads and, and, and help us to see the proper perspective from your word. This world says that man is basically good who has some flaws. And with, its, with man's potential comes man's ultimate fulfillment and ultimate accomplishment. But we know, Lord, humanism is from the pit of hell. We know, Lord, that humanism and confidence in the flesh is of the devil because apart from you, we can do nothing. So we pray, Lord, as your disciples, that you would help us to be bold, to not be discouraged, and to ask for your Holy Spirit to refill us so that we can have boldness to preach your word like your disciples did in the book of Acts, which we want to do. So thank you for your perspective. Thank you for how you can come in and interrupt our situations and and lift our heads and our perspective and encourage us as only you can. We love you so much. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.